We're going to start out today in the book of Job, chapter 13. And uh, I want to talk to you today about the pain of youth. There's an old saying, um, to be old and wise, you must first be young and stupid. <laughs> There's a, actually a t-shirt with that on I've seen. And uh, it's kind of funny because there was a video I saw came up in YouTube and it was, you know, dangerous things that children used to do back in the 1970s. You know, riding a bike without a helmet, drinking out of a garden hose. And I mean, I went through this whole list and I'm just check, check, check. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and it's kind of an interesting thing because I think that uh, in the past there was a lot more um, danger associated, I guess, with being a child and things, and and uh, we enjoyed it. it. It wasn't some kind of a thing of, oh no, I you know I fell off my bike and hit my head or something and get me to the hospital or something. No, uh, you just kind of accepted that 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 was part of growing up, part of having fun. And you say, but somebody could have been killed. Oh, there were children that were killed in our neighborhood. One died on a th in a three-wheeler accident, and, and there was a couple others and, and things. That, you know, they disappeared. And I remember there was a, we had this real tall sliding board at uh, the playground, Paradise Elementary School, and um, this real tall sliding board, real steep thing went down. This boy fell off the top. I mean, it was probably about a good eight or 10 feet up, you know. He fell off the top and hit and is laying there on the pavement. I remember seeing this pool of blood appearing around his head and, you know, and they got the ambulance there and everything and all the children were, you know, I mean, oh, we can't have that anymore. We have to protect children. We have, you know, just padded everything all around them or whatever. I think it's messing children up, to be quite frank. But uh, <clears throat> what the study is about is I want to encourage you to take chances as a young person, but be careful about sin, All right? It's fine to have a dangerous life and to do things that are, you know, you can get hurt or whatever else. I mean, the Christian life is kind of filled with some of that stuff. People don't uh, like Christians and whatever. Uh, but what I'm saying is be real careful about the sins of your youth that you do because they will come back later on in life. I'm going to be talking about some stories about myself <laughs> throughout this study and the stupid things I've done and how it's affected me now. But Job chapter 13, we'll begin in verse 23. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. You know, one of the marks of a true born-again believer is the fact that you'll not have a problem talking about your sin. You, you won't get offended if people call you a sinner or they talk, bring up your sins while well, you did this. And, oh, yeah, you know, you won't be offended by that. But you get these people, well, how dare you bring up my sins, my past and whatever. Eh, watch out for some of that stuff. Verse 24, wherefore hidest thou my, thy face and holdest me for thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to, to and fro and wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Uh, thou, see it there again, thou writest bitter things against me. Uh, you know that this book here, the Bible talks about back in the Revel book of Revelation, it, it's sweeter than honey in your mouth, but it gets down into your belly and it makes it bitter. You know, there's some real bitter things about this book. There's some real bad things. I mean, Hey, evolution, everything's getting better. We're, we're more intelligent. We're wealthier. The world's getting better. We have less, you know, war or something. I mean, the world's just going to get better and better, according to evolution. Uh, according to the Bible, it gets worse. <laughs> to the point where God has to come down and pretty much kill everybody on the earth. You know, he has to catch his church up and then say, okay, I'm going to pour out my judgment and wrath on the rest of the lost world, and mainly for the nation of Israel to see my power, and most of those will die. And I'm going to have to actually supernaturally shorten the days so that some flesh can be saved. Yay! <laughs> Fun time. Thou writest bitter things against me. But do you still love the Lord? He condemns you as a sinner. He says, hey, you know what? There is none righteous. That includes you. That includes me. Do you still love the Lord? He wrote some bitter things against you. You see how that works? And makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. You know, there's this weird idea that when God saves you, your sins are just poof, gone, including the, which is true in terms of judgment, 
but not in, in terms of the wages of sin, what you've earned. Right? If you've done drugs for many years before you got saved, don't think that all of a sudden you're just going to have a perfectly clear mind. Um, if you spent many years smoking cigarettes, oh, the health damage that you've done to your body isn't just going to go away. You know, when I got saved, when the Lord saved me, I'll say it that way, when he saved me, um, the problems that, and the dumb things that I did as a lost man, those health problems that I created as a result of my foolish living, um, they're still with me. I still have the scars. I didn't all of a sudden get saved and look down. And, hey, my scars are gone. Wow, and I'm just in perfect health now. No, I wrecked my health for many years, and I had to put up with a lot of really you know, horrible times going through a lot of detoxing as I started to eat more natural foods. But it, my health wasn't just perfect the day I got saved. It doesn't work that way. So understand what I'm saying here. Don't be afraid of living somewhat dangerously and doing some things and whatever else. And, and I mean, I see these young people and it's this weird thing like pain is some kind of a horrible disease or something. No, pain is necessary. It's a necessary part of life. You know, you go out and you work hard, it's going to make you feel pain. That doesn't mean you have chronic, some kind of fatigue syndrome or some kind of thing like this and you have to have medication or some kind of a deal. Uh, no, all right? So don't avoid pain, but avoid sin that will lead to pain later on in life. That's the key to this study here. If I can give you some advice as a young person. Job chapter 20. In other words, uh, I don't regret the uh, crazy stuff that I used to do as a young man um, in terms of having fun and riding dirt bikes and bicycles and, you know, getting in wrecks and, you know, doing fun things, climbing trees, you know, and whatever else. I don't regret that, all right? Those things are good memories for me. I'm glad I did that. It helped to build character within me. But what I regret are the things that I did that were sin that later on affected my health. Job chapter 20 and verse 11, his bones are full of the sin of his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. Um, there are some sins that you can do and it will be with you till you die. Just the way it is. It's not ever going to go away. Those are the things that you need to avoid. Job chapter 33. I mean, you know, you get to the point where you, you do something and as things are falling apart and you're about to get hurt really bad, you think, that was stupid. <laughs> and then whatever happens. I've had those experiences. Job chapter 33, verse 14. We'll read here. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the destroyers. Of course, Job's having a really hard time here. You understand why he's writing such gloomy stuff, but it gets better here in the next few verses. We'll get back to that. But I think it's an interesting thing. There, that one verse, um, verse 19, he is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. Uh, lower back for me. Um, every night of my life now, uh, there's no such thing as going to bed and sleeping straight through for eight hours doesn't happen. Um, I have a lot of back pain and I start out, I lay on my left side and then I lay on my back and then I lay on my right side and it's pretty much just lay there for a little while till it starts to hurt too bad. Then you have to move to another side then you move to another side. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. Um, why? Well, for many years I wore logging boots that had the big heel on the back. And so what happens with logging boots when you're standing like this, um, they go up like that so you start to lean forward and then you compensate by leaning back like this putting a lot of pressure on your lower back and then you put your head like this 
which causes problems with your neck. I used to go to a chiropractor and things, and he'd always say, boy, you're, you know, back's in pretty bad shape. And I remember the one time he's working on my back, and he gets down to the lower part, and he says, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, uh-oh. What do you mean, uh-oh? Well, he said, oh, your discs are disintegrating. They're deteriorating. Well, that's what you want to hear, you know. And um, why? Well, I ate sugar for most of my life. Junk food. I mean, I would eat junk food till I got sick. Literally, there were many times. I remember there was this family, uh, not a reunion, but there was a bunch of people got together, friends of my parents, and, and um, they had uh, one of their relatives had gone to Germany, and they came back. And um, so we were there with the whole big family get together. And one of the relatives worked at a candy factory in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I can't remember the name of it anymore, but um, they made Twizzlers was one of the things. And they had this whole table full of Twizzlers, strawberry Twizzlers. And uh, I remember I got a bag of them. <coughs> you take what you wanted. I went over and I got a bag and I snuck into my parents' car. We had a station wagon and I, and I remember I got in there and I was just opened up the bag and I was eating one Twizzler after another, just kept eating them. Uh, ate the whole bag of Twizzlers. Stupid, stupid thing to do. <laughs> Driving home, I thought I was going to die. I was laying in the back of the car. Oh, ended up vomiting before we got home. Um, I mean, I could tell story after story when it comes to sugar. I was stupid. Uh, sugar, white sugar, is incredibly bad for the body. And one of the things that it will do is it actually starts to break down your bone structure. It's not good for you if you have excess amounts of it. Very bad stuff. Well, um, bad back problems. And of course, you know, the many dirt bike accidents that I had over the years, that probably didn't help either. And then getting into logging and like I said, wearing the heeled logging boots, not good. And then lifting up logs and things and, and um, you know, that, that's too heavy. I can get it. You know, I'm a tough guy and everything. And, you know, picking up these big logs and carrying things around and, oh man, my lower back hurts. Yeah. And um, just to remind me that uh, I'm a lowly little worm to the Lord. Uh, two winters ago, I, if you follow the ministry, I fell down a flight of steps at our property. They were covered in ice and I went down and boom, 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 about four or five steps on my lower back. Thought I broke my back. It was very painful. It's all black and blue up my back and down my legs. And, and uh, what's the problem? Well, um, I wasn't very smart when I was a child. Not smart at all. And, um, you know, the pain thing, I'll tell you another story. Uh, when I was a boy, we went to a dentist. His name was Dr. Caldwell. Uh, I'll never forget that name. Dr. Caldwell, he ran his dentist practice out of his house. Um, there were still those guys around back when I was a boy. And I remember um, he didn't use Novocaine. Okay, no painkiller at all. So when he drilled out your tooth, you felt it. And uh, I remember the one time, one of the memories I have, I was pretty young and I just, again, you know, ate a lot of candy, a lot of junk food, and I just rotted my teeth out. Um, I mean, there's actually entries in my baby book I was looking at where my mother was saying that she was putting white sugar in my baby food when I was a year old to help me eat better. So, you know, a good way to make a child addicted to sugar. And I'm not blaming her for everything because I did my own part in it. I loved sugar and I never... I didn't really hold back until just recent years here as I've been getting more into natural health. And it has helped me quite a bit, but it's just, it's too late to correct all my health. It's just, I'm too far gone. So I have to live with the pain just the way it is. Again, it's part of the reason I'm warning you. If you're a younger viewer, stay away from the sugar and the junk food. All right. Um, but I remember this one time we were, uh, found out we were going to Dr. Caldwell's office and I thought, oh no, this is terrible. And I remember hearing some little rhyme or whatever, a, a, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. <laughs> I still remember to this day, we're driving and I'm sitting in the back of the station wagon. I always like to sit in the way back part of the station wagon. Can't even do that now. That'd be illegal, um, you know, without seat belts on. There's no seat belts in the back cargo area of these big old station wagons from the 1970s. And I'm sitting back there eating this apple and I'm thinking, I have to get this apple done before we get to the dentist office. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get this thing done and he's going to tell me to open my mouth. I'll open my mouth and he'll say, hey, it's perfect. No cavities, you know, not very smart. 
And so we get there to the dentist office. I had it just finished, you know, just getting the, the down to the core of it, you know, just a little center part. And I took it and threw it outside and walked in. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, and, it, and I guess, I don't know if I went first or one of my brothers or sisters went first, but it was my turn. I went in and I sat down. He said, okay, Brian, open your mouth. And I opened my mouth and he said, okay, it looks like we have three cavities. Oh, <laughs> oh no. And uh, and gets it in there. Ah, you know, I mean that was so painful. But uh, you say, well, then you learned your lesson. No, I didn't. I didn't. I still ate the candy. Foolish, foolish child. Um, I tell my son to avoid that stuff. My son, uh, he has some, you know, sugar. You know, real slight bits of it. Cane sugar, pure cane sugar that. If we make a some kind of a natural type cookie or whatever, they made molasses cookies yesterday. My wife and my son, very good, just real mild, barely any sugar at all in the entire recipe. Um, natural sugars from from uh, fruits and things like that, but in terms of lollipops and and candy of any kind, uh, chocolates and other types of sweets, no, he doesn't get any of that stuff. And we go to the bank and they say, "Would you like a lollipop?" <laughs> no, no, I don't want that. <laughs> he knows what it is. High fructose corn syrup and cold tart eyes is what lollipops are. Uh, there's nothing nutritional about a lollipop. You'd be better off eating the stick inside the lollipop than the lollipop itself. Uh, probably a little bit more fiber in there for you. But uh, my point is, brethren, um, and this is such an important thing, uh, remember that what you do, God can forgive you of any sin. That's true but your actions have consequences. Everything that you do, everything that I do, um, it's either going to go to help us in our walk with the Lord or to hurt us. And don't get mad at God because you have some things there from your past. Um, those are reminders. And I'll tell you what, uh, it's a real wonderful relationship when you get to the point where you can thank God for that sore back or for whatever other thing that you have. I look at my hands and, you know, this finger right here, you can see I'm not bending my hands like that. That's the way this hand is. These fingers are somewhat deformed because I used to get poison ivy really bad and it twisted these fingers and then dirt bike accidents and it just, you know, they'd be kind of weak and twisted and wrecking and things like that. <laughs> Logging the one time and I slipped and fell. It came right down and it twisted my finger back at this weird angle. So, you know, um, this thumb has a nice big scar cut through the tenon in, in the top while deconstructing a, a box fan to get the copper wires, scrapping it. <laughs> that was worth it. You know, a couple dollar or maybe a dollar or two of copper wiring um, and a couple hundred dollar surgery or, you know, stitching bill there. Real brilliant. Um, but in a way, I thank the Lord. For this stuff you know paul writes about how that uh you know he besought the lord thrice that his this thorn in the flesh would would leave would be taken from it. it's the messenger of satan to buffet me he said it's just always there kind of a thing and and the lord said uh, my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness and he says that he'll gladly rejoice in his infirmities um and i can say that i'm glad that i have some things wrong with me so that it forces me to pray. If the Lord just gave me perfect health and perfect everything, um, I'd probably forget the Lord. So hopefully you know where I'm going with this whole thing here. Um, Job chapter 33, verse 23 through 28. Let's read that. Excuse me. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable uh, unto him. And he shall, show, he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. It's a really good promise. 
good news. Um, I didn't say that everything bad that has happened in your past, there's no possible help there. God just can't do anything for you. Uh, no, there are times the Lord will give you good health. He will make you feel youthful again. Um, getting into natural health has been one of the best things for me. And I talk about it a lot. I recommend it to you, my viewers, a lot because it's very important. Um, I've been on pharmaceutical drugs. I have been vaccinated many times throughout my life, you know, as a child and things. Thankfully, it was, I was born in 1975, so there weren't, the vaccine schedule was not what it is today for these poor little children. Um, but, you know, I've been through all that different stuff. And, you know, I never thought I was going to live past about 40 years old. Well, I'm 47, going to be 48 here before real long. And there's many times I feel pretty good. I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, we can run and, and climb big mountains and things like that. So, yeah, I have my issues. You know, I have my back pain and things from years of being an idiot. But uh, the Lord's been pretty good to me. And the way I can fix my life up is not through all the natural health stuff. Primarily, that's there. It's by righteousness with the Lord. Lord, I did these stupid things. Please have mercy on me. Please help me with this or whatever. That's where your help comes from. So just be encouraged about that, brethren. Psalm 25. Um, you know, I'm not trying to depress anybody here and say, well, you know, God saved you, but now he can't do anything to help you with your health. You're just going to have to suffer and be in pain forever. No. Um, God can do some things. But uh, he'll leave enough there to remind you of your past. <laughs> uh, why? Because he doesn't want you going back to it. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 7. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Uh, that should be a prayer for you right there. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. Um, I'm really sorry, Lord, you know, I mean, see, again, this, one of the things that has irritated me so much that I've dealt with online, mostly, um, that is this thing, this teaching of this easy believism thing where you get saved and there's just no conviction of sin. There's no, just, it's all gone. It's all in the past. Don't think about it. Whatever the life of repentance, when you repent of sin, that means you look at yourself as a sinner and you realize God is holy, God is perfect, and he actually had to die on the cross to pay for what I've done? That's horrible. That's a terrible thing. Man, I can't believe he had to suffer for me, for my sake. Would you accept Jesus as your Savior? Would you accept his death on the cross to pay for your sins? Well, sure, absolutely. If he'll take me. See, that's the right attitude. Not, well, yeah, I just believe. I don't have to pray to God or anything else. That's very bad. And see, that repentance of sin that starts at salvation, it continues throughout your whole life. A righteous man thinks about the sins of his youth and says, you know, Lord, I've asked for forgiveness many times here, but you know, it just, it comes back to me sometimes. And I can't believe you saved an old sinner like me, Lord. And thank you so much for saving me. You'll always remember that stuff. You know, I mean, there's times I have a miserable night of sleep. There's times I might get four hours of sleep at night because I'm just laying there tossing and turning and thinking about this and, you know, what should I say about that argument? And, and oh, maybe I could do a sermon on this and uh, I have to get back to bed or, you know, whatever. And I just think, I wake up in the morning sometimes my back hurts and I think, oh man, it's just, oh, I deserve it. Uh, Lord, uh, you know all the dumb things I've ever done and I know you've forgiven me, but, you know, I can't really ask you to take this away completely, this pain away, because, you know, I pretty much deserve it. But, uh, Lord, just remember that I'm trying to serve you here with my life. Please just kind of help me as much as you can without, you know. That's the way a Christian thinks. We are appointed to suffer in this life. 
You don't just get out a, a some kind of a special, you know, Christianity is this ultra positive type of a thing and God just takes care of all your problems and whatever. Uh, no. Doesn't work that way. Psalm 25, let's go down to verse 18. Look upon my affliction, mine affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies for they are many and they hate me with cruel hatred. O keep my soul and deliver me. Let, not, let me not be ashamed for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. Wait on the Lord. Um, there's a lot of things that you're going to go through where you're just going to, you know, I don't understand the timing here of the Lord. What is he waiting for? You know, the catching up of the body of Christ. I mean, I thought for years, oh, it's going to happen here. It has to happen in 2011 because that's the 400th anniversary of the King James. And <laughs> yeah, I started coming up trying to get all these dates and things. I first started hearing about some of these guys coming out, oh, September of 2015, you know, that stuff. And I, I said, well, maybe it's true. I hope it's true. <laughs> I want to get out of here. But we have to wait on the Lord. You say, but I'm going to get older, brother, and I'm going to have more pain in that time. Okay. Question number one, do you deserve more pain because of what dumb things you've done with your life? You say, no, brother, I've actually done quite a bit and whatever. Okay. Question number two, can the Lord help you get through that pain? Is that pain going to draw you closer to him? Uh, yeah, it's better, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Go to the New Testament to the book of Romans and chapter 8. God, I, I don't understand why I just can't sleep at night. I'm having these problems and I'm you know, 47 years old and I have insomnia and I can't sleep right and then I wake up and I'm driving and you know, I'm just, uh, whatever. Lord, could you help me? And the Lord says, uh, yeah, what would you do about sugar all those years? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, I guess I deserve it. But if you could help me a little bit, Lord, I'd sure appreciate it. You know, just give me a nice night of sleep occasionally or something. Like I said in my video way back a couple months ago when we got really sick, my wife and I, Oliver got sick and he was over it in a day or two, maybe three days at the most, you know, that he had a little bit of remnants of it. But my wife and I, we were sick for couple weeks this time, which is very rare. But I remember um, that part of the sickness, I was just wiped out, just physically drained. And I would sleep just, I could not wake up. I would just get back into bed and sleep and go back to bed and sleep. And it was actually pretty nice <laughs> for a change. I thought, wow, I'm so out of it. I can actually sleep, you know, for many hours. And I actually felt caught up on my sleep. Um, but then you get better, and you know, I got better, and then I started to have the sleep issues again. Spiritual attacks throughout the night, you know. I mean, please understand, your prayers mean something. They really mean something to me. Um, please pray for the Lord to just strengthen me and keep me going, because well, I get attacked a lot, okay? I mean, you've seen what's been happening the last few videos here. Uh, there are a lot of people that hate me. Okay, uh, I have a different opinion than them, and they think that that gives them the right to come out with all kinds of lies and horrible stuff that they're saying about me. Um, and then I get, you know, the bad dreams and the spiritual attacks and all the other stuff. I mean, if it preaching, just to give you a warning, you want to get into preaching, I'm going to tell you right now, it is never a nine to five job, ever. I don't know one preacher, and I've known a, a couple of them and talked to them in person. I don't know one that it was a nine to five job. It's the most bizarre scheduling. You know, you have some big thing to do that day and you have a terrible night of sleep or there's some other spiritual attack. Just out of the blue, somebody shows up and wants to talk to you or somebody attacks you. or It's just so unpredictable, you know. And uh, I mean, I've said so many times I've lost count. I'm going to do a study on such and such. And it's my plan. I've, I start to write the notes and I start to do the study. And all of a sudden, it's just this thing happens and that thing happens and all this other stuff. And I get completely sidetracked and it might be a year or two later. Oh, yeah. You know, that's just the way it is. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 25. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Um, let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, well, let me read the other verses. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Please understand a very important New Testament doctrine. You and I, if you're born again, you are two-thirds saved. Two parts of the three parts of your body are saved. Your soul and your spirit. Your soul is redeemed. Your spirit is quickened. Your body is not saved. Your body, my body, is just as corruptible and lost as any wicked lost heathen out there walking around. And that's the truth. We are waiting right there. Waiting, verse 23, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. This is not saved. That's why you have the pain yet. The remembrance of what you did in your past. You see? The redemption of the purchased possession, the redemption of our body, comes at the catching up, the resurrection. That's why you don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Posties have no idea about that stuff. But yeah. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth... Why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Okay? <laughs> Such an important thing. Uh, Lord, please save me. I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. When you have light flashes like this and it comes up. Wow, I got my new body. Well, everybody and their brother would want to be saved at that point in time. They'd say, hey, I want a new body too. And then you'd have a bunch of you know, immortal people walking around down here, that'd be a kind of an issue. Um, that's not how God designed it. We don't, we don't see what we hope for. I hope that I get a new body someday. I've done some real damage to this one. You know, uh, can you see it? Is it? What's it going to look like? I don't know. I hope, though, for what I can't see. I have to live by faith that the Bible's true and it says I'm going to get a new body someday. Someday this old corruptible flesh is going to be redeemed. You know, my grandfather, he's been dead since 1991, Milton Denlinger. Um, if I went to his grave and, and uh, started digging up his body, I'm not going to find a perfect, you know, uh, immortal body there waiting for the rapture. No, I'm going to find a skeleton. Maybe, you know, I don't even know what the condition of the bones would be in from 1991 till now. Uh that's just the way it is. It's a corruptible body. All right. But when the Lord says, come up hither and he catches us up, I believe my grandfather, I be totally believe the man was saved. He was a, a very godly man. He goes up and I'm going to meet him in the clouds with the Lord. And I'm going to say, grandpa. And he's going to say, Brian, boy, I'm glad you turned out the way you did. But back when you were 17 years old, when I died, uh, you were sure an idiot. <laughs> yes, grandpa. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Oh, well, uh, well, I was a good view. No, I was an idiot when I was a, a teenager. I'm very ashamed of the young man that my grandfather saw. And I know I very much vexed him and I very much upset him with where I was going in my life. But uh, I'll see him again. Looking forward to that time for the redemption of uh, our body. And... Um, Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for the Antichrist covenant? Uh, no, we don't. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. When does that happen? At the catching up of the body of Christ. Hmm. Oh no, it's the, the first seal. The Antichrist being unleashed. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, no, no, no. You don't understand Bible doctrine. The resurrection is the next event for the body of Christ. We are not appointed to the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the time of Israel's trouble. All right. I've been seeing some stuff again. Posties coming along. This guy believes in pre-trib rapture. Did you believe it? Oh, he's such a dummy. Uh, 
Okay, first of all, it's not called a pre-trib rapture. It's the catching up, caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. If you haven't seen my studies, you know, some of them were called. I was saying pre-trib rapture just to get people to understand what I'm talking about. But that's a time that is not for the body of Christ. I'm waiting, I am patiently waiting the redemption of the purchased possession. I'm waiting for the redemption of my body. And as time goes by, I'm going to have more pain. You know, when I had my thumb fixed up, when they fixed up this thumb here, and they said, you know, we can do this reconstructive surgery and you can, you know, uh, we'll reconnect the tendons. And I said, what happens if you don't? And she said, well, she said, you're going to have a lot of pain. She said, you probably won't be able to bend it when you get older. And, uh, and I said, meh, okay. And I said, I don't, I don't feel like doing that. I'll just, you know, deal with it. And she was kind of shocked, you know, this doctor, this Roman Catholic doctor. And um, she told me she was a Roman Catholic. That's how I knew that. I didn't know her, you know, personally or anything. And the one nurse that was there, she was getting all mad, you know, and, oh, this is ridiculous, you know. And she said, you won't be able to touch your thumb to your fingers. She said, that's what separates us from the apes. <laughs> At the Ephrata Hospital uh, many years ago when I did that stupid thing to my thumb. And, uh, and she said, you won't be able to touch your thumb to your fingers. And I went, I can do it right now, <laughs> okay. Um, she said, you'll be wearing sweatpants for the rest of your life. You won't be able to buckle up your pants. <laughs> Your finger won't work if you don't get the reconstructive surgery. Uh, no, uh, I don't have health insurance, so um, my thumb will heal and I'll deal with the pain and whatever else comes with it. Why? Uh, because I have a guarantee that I'm getting a new body, you see. So I'll just put up with the old one here that I've made a wreck out of and I'll try to do my best to keep it in as good a shape as possible. But if you're young, boy, you have an opportunity Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You have an opportunity if you are young to take care of the body that you've been given. Don't mistreat it with uh, poison pop and fast food, junk food, and all kinds of other garbage. Don't destroy your body. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble, even or as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Let me just park there for one second. I, I hear Calvinists using this, that you have to endure things for the elect's sake. That's the elect that are going to be saved. No, Paul is talking about the Jews, okay? That's what he's talking about. The elect of God there according to the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's an election there. All right, you can read Romans chapter you know, 11 and things. You can see about some of that stuff. So don't fall for that Calvinistic nonsense. Um, continuing, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, not Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay, so it's not talking about you'll, you'll, he'll deny us in the sense of you lose your salvation and you're gone or something. No, it's just simply saying you'll lose rewards and inheritance in the coming thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. But again, notice, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. You're going to suffer. You will suffer in many different ways as a Christian. When you get saved, I am not like one of these liars out there, these uh, modern church hirelings that tell you that Christianity is just all positive and you can have a wonderful marriage and you can have this and that and whatever. No, the devil's going to attack your marriage. The devil's going to attack you through your family. The devil's going to attack your children, your grandchildren. The devil's going to attack you at work. The devil's going to attack you when you go to the store. The devil's going to attack you when you go to a gas station. The devil's going to attack you just your health. He's going to mess up your dreams. He's going to, you know, do whatever he can. And the more you do for the Lord, the more you're going to suffer. The more you're, you're going to get hit. And there's going to be times where you will have pain and you can't trace it back to anything that you did in your past. And you just say, okay, it's a spiritual attack or whatever. There will be times when you will have pain that's based on the sins of your youth. You have to weigh all that stuff out. So the smart way to go through life 
brethren, is to try to do as little messing up as you can. <laughs> try to stay in fellowship with the Lord. Revelation chapter 21. And here we get into the actual uh, future that you have, the glorious future of being in New Jerusalem. And the this is when you have your new body and everything. Let's read here. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall, be the, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. So there you go. Um, try your best to live as pain-free as possible, okay? Uh, certainly. But don't get such the, a little, if, especially if you're a guy, don't get effeminate to the point where you don't want to do anything. You're, you know, I want to be on a little satin pillow and I, I don't want to take a chance here and I don't want to take a chance. If the Lord tells you to do something, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If he wants me to do something, he'll get me through this. And as times get rougher, and they're about to get very rough, I believe, um, he might ask you to do some things that are going to cause you some pain. Um, we have done a lot of things that uh, have gotten us to the point of living debt-free, and there's pain involved. Um, we don't have running water. I haven't had running water in a house since 2018. Okay, <laughs> five years, no running water. You say, what have you done the whole time? Oh, I've carried uh, water jugs, 70-pound water jugs, one in each hand. So that, that sounds kind of difficult. Yeah, it is, especially when the stairs are icy. And, um, you know, there's times in the summer months where the spring dries up. And we have to figure out other ways to do it and this and, and whatever. Uh, the other times that I'm feeling rather sick and I have to lift a water jug up from the floor up onto the sink area and, you know, get it set up so that everybody has water. Um, it's tough. But you know what? Um, it's a good thing. It keeps me in good shape. You know, I again, tell you another story. Uh, the one property we used to have in Littleton, Maine. Uh, I remember the one time I had a bunch of things to take back to the property. And our drunken Catholic neighbor, he would always block the right of way going back to it. So I just said, well, oh, I'll carry it back. And he said, the, there was a guy I was working with him. And uh, he said to me, he said, about how far back do you have to carry that stuff? And it was a whole bunch of five-gallon buckets, and I'm holding it, you know, just kind of balancing them on my shoulder, trying to keep the thing together, hold the little metal handles. And I said, oh, it's about a half mile. And he said, you're carrying those things back a half mile? Man, you're nuts. He was a big, strong guy. Big hunter, you know, everything else, outdoorsman. You're carrying all that weight back on your shoulder a half mile back in the woods? Yeah. See, that's the right kind of pain. You know, the old exercise slogan, no pain, no gain. Um, yeah, you want to get strong and you want to do things, it's going to require some pain. And brethren, if you want to live by this book, live according to the scriptures, it's going to cause you pain. Oh, uh, brother, we, we need to have two incomes because we can't survive on one income. Why not? We do. We don't make that much money. We survive on one income, but we have to feel some pain. Okay? Um, there are times we can't have certain things. We can't just go to the bank and just say, hey, give me a mortgage for this and a, and a loan for that, and I want this and I want that right now. No, there's times it takes some, a while. You know, I apologize for the inefficiency of this ministry, but the amount of money coming in has to translate to, you know, what we are able to buy and things like that. We do our best. But we're not very efficient just simply because we're not going to go into debt. I will never be a, that kind of a burden on the body of Christ. That I say, hey, you know, you have to support us because we have bills to pay here. We have, you know, monthly mortgage and all this other stuff. I mean, we have regular bills of electricity and internet, you know, and whatever groceries we eat and things. 
But uh, some kind of bank payments and things? No, we don't mess with that. We're okay with the pain that comes along with it. We're okay with, uh, you know, having to be in this place in the winter months. We're not going to heat this whole place. It would cost thousands of dollars. We're just not going to do it. And there are times it's painful. There are times my hands are so frozen and our, all of our hands are so frozen and just try to get them down near a little electric heater and things like that. Why? Because I have to suffer a little bit to keep living the way that I want to live. Please let this study encourage you. Um, if you're going through some pain, remember that we are waiting, patiently waiting. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout that glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. That's it. I don't talk enough about the resurrection. I'm going to be doing some more of that in the future. I mean, I've preached so many studies on the, you know, catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, but the resurrection is, it, it's our blessed hope. It's everything. To wit, the redemption of our body. You get a new one. So uh, take care of your body. Keep your body under subjection, okay? No, don't eat that sugar. No, don't drink that. That's bad for you. Don't eat this. Don't watch too much so your eyes hurt and whatever. You know, take care of your body, but not to the point where you become sissy and effeminate. No, I don't want to take any chances and I don't want to offend people and whatever else. You're getting a new body, all right? And the amount of suffering that you do in this life determines your in eternity, your eternal inheritance. So that is going to be it. I don't think he was going 25 miles an hour. <laughs> so uh, that, of course, never happens in this town, yeah. But uh, so we will see everybody in future studies. And um, thank you very much for watching. And uh, please do keep us in your prayers. We really do need those prayers.